Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. My name is Christina Hopner and I welcome you to this session on Mahara, which is a brief introduction to this ePortfolio system. Um, I'm the project lead and work for Catalyst in New Zealand and you might have already been in touch with, a, with at least one of my colleagues from whom you've received the invitation to the session. And Catalyst can be found in a number of places. Um, we started in Wellington in 1997, um, that is the headquarters, expanded to Aust um, Auckland and Christchurch have those other two offices in New Zealand and also have three offices in uh, Australia, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. Um, but we can also be found um, in Europe because Kiwis like to travel and um, like to do an overseas experience and explore different parts of the world. And that's how our European office came into existence, uh, which is now located in Brighton. And um, we've also had a, an EU office for Europe, uh, in terms of European Union office um, in Dublin. Earlier this year, um, we also started a company in Canada. Um, there's no, not quite a location there yet due to the pandemic and um, everybody just working from home. So there's definitely local support available, um, probably relatively close to where you are living, looking at the people who are in the chat. And um, of course, we are also available remotely and work with organizations around the world. Now our focus today is uh, of course not Catalyst but Mahara itself, um, the ePortfolio system which was founded in Aotearoa in 2006. Um, that's when the development work started and it was actually a project of a number of tertiaries here in the country that had decided that a learning management system is not enough for their students because it was only possible really to track formal work, assignments, um, other activities, classroom discussions and the like. And um, so the tertiary said that, well, we, we want to give more control into the student's hand and allow them to decide what is important of their learning to keep. And so in 2005, project proposal was written um, that was accepted. And then in 2006, the work started and Catalyst has been involved with Mahara directly from that very first moment and was also instrumental in making it an open source project as we can see it today. Personally, I started uh, working with Mahara in 2008 uh, while still in Europe um, at the University of Luxembourg. And um, then in mid 2010, I moved down south and started working with the development team here at Catalyst. And we are the main developers and also the maintainers of the open source project. And therefore, you always hear from us when there are security updates available and other minor point updates to the version of Mahara that you are using if you are already using Mahara. And um, we also make the major version releases, uh, of which we have two per year. And while Mahara is of course, a software that can be installed that is open source, so you do not have to work with the company to um, get access to it. There are no license fees and the like. Um, Mahara is not just about the software, but it is also about people that use Mahara, that work with Mahara on a regular basis. And so we have a number of Max Mahara user groups and you can see a cluster here over on the western side of um, the screen and um, lots of activity in the UK with Makara in Scotland, MUM, Mahara Users Group Midlands, or Mahara Users Midlands and also Maxi for Southern England. Very big French community, very active German community and then also kind of going further east, we have, um, have the 
Japanese uh, group that has been using Mahara for many, many years and also um, has a very active translator who keeps Mahara up to date with a Japan, full Japanese translation at all times. And then, of course, um, us here in Aotearoa and also a user group over where many of you are in Australia. And not to forget the North Americans, um, a user group in Canada and also in New York. And of course, they, they try to organize events. Um, there used to be more face-to-face -face events than just recently this year. Um, the, the nice thing about having remote events is, is of course that people from one region can also talk more easily to people in another region or time zone. Um, but the, the groups were founded initially really to have that local context and um, have shared knowledge, shared understanding and also the shared language. Because while everybody has schools and universities, um, the systems do differ between the countries. And um, that is where the local support comes in so that um, everybody can also yeah, talk in the same language. So Mahara is an e-portfolio system. Well, what does that mean to us? What is important for us in Mahara? Um, I'm not going to have a hands-on session with you today, but really talk more in general terms about why we are having portfolios and uh, what sort of portfolios can be created in Mahara to give you that overview and then invite you to um, check out our demo instance if you do not already have um, a Mahara site on your own that you can use at uh, demo.mahara.org. Now, kind of when we are talking about portfolios, it has always got to, to start with a definition. And um, I really like this one here from Ricky Suter. And her definition is based on the concept of folio thinking um, that has been advocated by Helen Chen from Stanford University, who's been an e-portfolio practitioner and researcher for many, many years. And she is not, she doesn't work in the traditional portfolio fields um, on a consistent basis, um, like what we know from design and education, for example. But she does a lot of work with mechanical engineering um, at Stanford and also looks at portfolio initiatives for an entire organization. And that is where her her breadth of information and knowledge comes from. And also all of that, of course, uh, went into the definition of folio thinking. And so therefore we have a very encompassing definition of it. And so kind of going through this definition there, there are a few key points that are really important um, that highlight why a portfolio is very different than just your computer or having an archive sitting somewhere in the cloud where you just dump all your learning evidence. Because folio thinking is a process of engaging in the collection, organization, reflection and connection that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely, i.e. tell stories, about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value, and how the experience relate one to each other. So on your computer, you can collect and you organize. What the portfolio really focuses on then is the reflection and the meaning making between all of these um, pieces of evidence or um, the experiences in general, even if there's not a tangible piece of evidence and really connect to all of those. And instead of just sitting them next to each other, what we want to do is tell a story. And then also not just tell the story necessarily only to ourselves, but share that with others because through that sharing do we also learn. Um, 
by explaining something to somebody else or sharing our reflections, um, we can get feedback on them and therefore engage with others to, to learn from them, learn from their experiences and also um, yeah, get their thinking of what um, they believe has gone really well um, in our learning. And then of course relate all of those to each other. So if you're kind of putting that into action verbs, um, for me, they are altogether five activities that Mahara supports. And most of them are portfolio related. Um, there's one also that um, is also a little goes beyond that. And before we can actually have a portfolio, we need to create content. And so typically that creation happens outside of the software. Um, but because it is needed for the portfolio itself, that's why I'm kind of uh, making it part of the portfolio process and the activities that Mahara supports. Because you can create learning evidence directly in Mahara by writing text or by creating a journal entry. And a journal entry does not even necessarily have to be a reflection. Um, so create content, but also then collect content from other sources, presentations, certificates, um, videos you've taken, and maybe even already uploaded to the internet, um, to a social media site or images that you've shared or that you want to put into your portfolio. So those two items, the creation and the collection, those are the easy bits of the portfolio. And it gets trickier once it comes to that reflective element, which sticking to my five C's and trying to find words that I'll start with a C, um, we have the curation, the curation of the evidence that is available to us. And that is where the meaning making and the sense making comes in um, because we in a portfolio we do not want to show everything that we have done but we want to be very selective of what we want to share um, and then work with that curate it reflect on it and make those connections after that once we have our portfolio it comes to the conversation state we want to converse with people um, invite them to look at our portfolio, um, invite them to leave comments or feedback and therefore engage us in our learning process, but also support them in their learning because they might really learn something um, from our experiences. And this is the area, so the collect, curate and uh, converse and collect also includes, for, for me includes the organization um, element. That is what folio thinking covers. And so Mahara goes a little beyond that um, because it also allows us to make connections with other people and not just as part of conversations, but by working in groups, by creating even portfolios collaboratively in a group, um, by having discussions in a group, having shared files and therefore really allow us to work individually on the site, but also collaboratively with others um, when the situation calls for it. So we have a definition, we have some action verbs, and now how could we bring that concept of portfolios across to students or to staff members? Because portfolios are not just for high school or university students, but they can also be employed in organizations. Um, we've started working more extensively with healthcare providers, um, for example, for nursing portfolios, recertification portfolios. Um, portfolios are extensively used in any profession that has some sort of certification. Um, that is from hairdressing to plumbing, um, in New Zealand, also funeral directors started using portfolios um, about a couple of years ago. Um, construction workers are using portfolios and so on. So there are lots of possibilities and lots of areas in which portfolios can be used. So how do we take away that 
um, or how do we make it clear to people what a portfolio is and what you can do? Well, we can employ a metaphor. And so um, one of the metaphors that is very popular is the portfolio as a museum or as an art or as a gallery. Um, here I'm kind of going from the, um, from the idea that Mandy Mentis um, developed at Messi University. Um, but of course also many others uh, talk about the portfolio as a museum. And the image here is from our graphic designer Yvonne. And um, you're very welcome to use it. By the way, you will be receiving the slides after this presentation, um, along with a link to the video. Um, so you're yeah, very welcome then to click on images and go to portfolios once we get to them. So in a museum, um, we have the collection element, typically in the basement or in an off-site storage archive location and so on. And um, if the museum wants to put on a new exhibition, create a new portfolio, the curator looks in the archive, what do we have available? Um, so if it is an exhibition on a particular artist, they collect everything that they have from that artist, sort it, look at it, and then decide, they curate, what they want to put upstairs into the museum itself. So there's hardly ever the case that everything that a museum has of the topic will be displayed. But there's a careful selection in order to make sure that the story that the museum wants to tell with the exhibit, it can be understood. And so once the curator puts up, um, takes their things upstairs into the museum, pictures are being hung on the wall, any physical artifacts are being displayed. We might even have digital um, displays that are being created for this exhibit to interact or to help people interact with certain artifacts or with certain concepts. Then they also help us tell that story and understand that story by typically having either a catalog for the exhibit or on smaller exhibits, um, just a, um, a description or a summary or a background and any other thoughts that they want to showcase in order for us to understand what that story is. And then on each artifact, we also have kind of sort of metadata. Um, typically it is when it was created, who it was, what material it consists of and so on. And that is our portfolio. So one exhibition room can be a portfolio or, and that in Mahara would be a page. Or alternatively, in an exhibition can span multiple rooms. So in Mahara lingo, that would be a collection, a portfolio that consists of multiple pages um, so that we can organize the content much, uh, much better than if we just had everything on one page cramped in really short, uh, small spaces. And so in the museum, you can also decide which um, exhibits are for free, which ones you need to pay for. In the portfolio lingo for Mahara, that would be a free um, access. Um, anybody in the world can look at a portfolio, but typically you might actually want to have a closed door and only um, submit an assignment portfolio and only an instructor can look at it or a lecturer um, or only a particular class can take a look at a portfolio. And then in the museum, we can, you have the visitors portfolio viewers and they can go through, wander through the exhibits um, to which they have access. They can leave feedback. Um, sometimes they can interact with it if they are um, displays for children in particular, but they don't have to walk through it on their own. So they can walk through with, um, with a friend or um, also with, with others from their same class. And um, sometimes they might even have the artist there who takes them through the exhibit in order to explain what it's all about. So I think this metaphor works really well um, to explain what a portfolio is using language that um, learners can understand. 
if you feel like your oh, museum, my, my students don't really go there that frequently, um, that might not be the best metaphor. Um, there is also the portfolio as a performance as a metaphor, for example. Um, that is an idea that came from Hazel Owen. Um, she lives in New Zealand. And um, there we have yeah, perf a, a performance hall um, where on the left hand side we have um, the artists who are practicing. There's a door, nobody else can get in. So that is in portfolio lingo, then the preparation of the portfolio. And in this case, we have a group portfolio. And so nobody can get in besides them, um, only they have a swipe card. Then there's another group in the same hall. Um, so a different um, group or individual who prepare a different performance. And they are in earlier stages because they are still writing um, of what should go in there, how they want to have it to work. And um, in this case, they collaborate. Then you have the performances itself um, that of where the writing team makes the decision whether to modernize it, whether to have it in old English, um, if it were an old play or in any other way. They have the props uh, that need to be decided on. And then you have viewers who can also give feedback. And in your same account, so in the same hall, you can have a very different looking portfolio by having a rock concert. In this case, again, you've got viewers um, and the, the purpose of the performance is a very different one than if you're sitting down for a theater production. There are many different, many more metaphors um, for explaining what a portfolio is. And I find it is always important to, to use language that can be understood by the people that whom you want to read. Because oftentimes, unfortunately, the term portfolio itself um, has had a negative uh, connotation for many. And so we want to, of course, um, turn that into a positive one and say and, and help them work with it and not see it as that extra that takes time but really incorporate it into the learning process um, so that it just flows uh, with time becomes a habit for people to um, push their learning content or learning evidence into the portfolio and then reflect on it and invite others to view it. As an example of um, looking at what portfolio language can can be like um, where we have the collection, create, uh, collect, create, curate, uh, converse and connect elements in there. Um, this portfolio here from Theresa McKinnon at Warwick University over in the UK is a very good one. Um, if you look at the slides yourself, um, then you can click the image and you'll be taken to the portfolio. Um, or once I send you the slides, you can click it and then go there. But right now, I'm not really wanting to focus on the entire portfolio and only pulled out a few phrases for you to focus on. Um, because those are the ones that really show how Teresa curated her learning evidence well because she doesn't just give us everything. She says the point at which I realized she draws our attention to that. She revisited um, each of the sections of her previous portfolio. She looked back, she reflected on that. Um, a highlight in her teaching, learning and assessment was, and then also getting feedback and mentoring was helpful. So she engaged with other people who helped her in her learning process. And nowhere in, in these terms does she mention reflection um, or portfolio. Portfolio does come, of course, um, we do see it because she is creating her CMLT portfolio, um, but the language doesn't have to use any of those trigger terms that sometimes might um, have a rather negative connotation for people because they 
have not um, had good experiences with them. Um, they might not have ever been introduced to how to reflect properly or what questions they can ask when to reflect and were just asked to do it but didn't have enough guidance. Now, if you're briefly taking a look at some other examples of portfolios, um, I'd like to start with one that um, is from an art student at the University of the Arts London, um, an organization that makes a lot of their portfolios publicly accessible um, because they want art students to showcase their work and also showcase their assignments is uh, this portfolio here, which is um, in general a very simple one um, because all it has is images and text. So the student uh, went around London, took photos and then added them to their portfolio, provided a brief introduction. And this portfolio or this page is just one page of the entire portfolio. Um, you can explore more of their portfolio by going to the other pages. And um, UAL uses Mahara quite extensively for assignment portfolios and not necessarily for showcase portfolios. So you, you, there you see a lot of work in progress. And that is um, a point where, where Mahara can really shine um, by having a develop, developmental or progress portfolio or in the more general term, um, creating a learning portfolio and putting all the evidence in and then also invite people to discuss it. A very different portfolio is one that nurses create in New Zealand. And as an example here, Waiate Mata um, has had a portfolio for many, many years on paper and they received heavy binders from the nurses because the nurses needed to talk about their practice over three years. And um, they went electronic um, about two years ago and um, created the online portfolio and taking that as an opportunity to also revisit what should actually go into the portfolio while staying within the frame that they had been given by the nursing council, of course, and what was necessary and what they could leave off. And so if you want to um, listen to their story of what, uh, how the portfolio implementation went, um, the link for this portfolio takes you to the, uh, um, to the presentation that we did earlier in the year, um, talking through the portfolio itself and um, what was involved to get to this point. So the portfolio for the nurses is highly uh, formalized because it is a certification portfolio for registered nurses and so what um, the team at Viatimata has done really really well is incorporate um, the competencies, self-assessment, peer assessment and then um, sign of and verification um, into their process and so the portfolio is very simple for the nurses to create because what they do is they um, write their self-assessment for one um, competency and then a peer also assesses them blindly in their case on that competency. And because the portfolio is quite long with about 10, um, 10 to 12 pages, the nurse can then sign off her portfolio or his portfolio um, and indicate on a cover page um, how much they've already done so that when their manager comes for the verification, um, they can see that very quickly which pages they can already look at and which pages still need to be worked on. So it's a very fantastic portfolio to see how assessment portfolios and also certification portfolios can work. On top of doing a lot on Mahara itself, the team also in integrates with a learning management system 
where the overall final assessment um, is then taking place, where reporting is being done on the portfolios and where then in the future also notifications could be generated for um, certificates that are issued or for reports that a manager might need. And one last portfolio um, that I want to show you, which is not as much a portfolio as such, but rather an invitation to, um, for some activities that you could run uh, when you want to get into portfolios, is this uh, resource page that my colleague over in Europe has created, Sam Taylor on designing effective e-portfolio activities. So here she provides a plan for activities and uses a number of Mahara features by embedding um, slide presentations into her page and then have working with different blocks on her page so that um, she has some text has a license, files to download, and then also links. And because of course she has a lot of activities in um, this, this plan of activities, but doesn't want to show everything immediately on the page so that as not to overload people, she also uses the retractability functionality that we have on Mahara so that it's very easy to focus on the sections that you're most interested in without being um, disrupted by any others that you don't have to worry about just right now. So that is a great um, place to look for activities that you might to incorporate into your own portfolio introductions and implementations. There are a few other um, or number of other examples that you could uh, take a look at. So there is a link um, that you can follow where publicly accessible portfolios are listed. Um, because I, of course, can only show you those to which we also have public access. And the majority of portfolios is actually private. So showing you more assessment portfolios um, can sometimes be a bit tricky because they are not necessarily publicly shared. Which of course is an advantage of Mahara because you can decide um, what portfolios you want to share widely and which ones you do want to keep just to yourself. And so looking at all of those portfolio initiatives, one thing that is really true and very important in all of that is the support. Um, staff members who uh, learning designers in particular need to have time in order so, to support faculty members, lecturers, tutors, and also students in implementing um, portfolios. And therefore, it is always good when management um, or the administration um, supports portfolio initiatives and also makes time for their staff. And then also support in the sense that students oftentimes need scaffolding um, in order to create their portfolios. So now there's, there's lots of e-portfolio systems around. Um, there are also systems that are not necessarily e-portfolios that can be used for portfolio purposes. So why would you want to go with Mahara? Well, I think altogether there are at least 12 reasons for that. And number one is that Mahara is learner centric. Um, instructors, lecturers, students do not immediately have access to portfolios um, if you're using Mahara out of the box, but the learner needs to invite them into their own space. Uh, Mahara portfolios are quite versatile because you're not bound to just one type of portfolios, but you can use portfolios for, or Mahara portfolios for learning purposes, for development, for assessment, for showcasing, um, for employability reasons, to keep an internship portfolio, to apply for a job. Um, and as you've seen with Sam's example, to even create small web pages that contain content and instructions. Mahara is social because we do foster social connections between people, invite others to comments and uh, feedback. And it can also 
uh, hold multimedia content, um, so audio, video, and images and many other media files can be uploaded or um, you can embed them if you already have them from another site. It is supportive because we don't let you sit in front of a blank piece of a uh, blank screen, but um, on every screen in Mahara there our students will know what can be done there. There are title spaces, there are descriptions, there are tags that can be added. And therefore, from the infrastructure, we provide that support. Portfolios are accessible. Um, kind of going a little bit with that uh, versatile uh, category there. Um, because while lots of portfolios, of course, should ideally be for lifelong learning and not just to complete a particular course or a particular assignment, oftentimes um, having assessments is an incentive for an organization to have an e-portfolio and also to work with it on a regular basis. Mahara is mobile. Um, you don't need an app to run Mahara on your mobile device. It just works because it's responsive. But if you do want to use a map, you can use Mahara Mobile, um, which exists now again in the iOS and Android store. We just released a new version of it. And um, that mobile app is not a replacement for the website, but rather an add-on. Because with the app, you can collect your evidence offline. You can prepare it with file names, descriptions, tags. You can also write a journal um, entry on your mobile phone if you like. And um, all of that while not being connected to the internet. So that is really good if you're working in a rural area or um, being on a ship, um, going to Antarctica or somewhere else. Um, or when you work maybe even in a hospital setting where you might not be allowed to have a, a mobile or have Wi-Fi on. And then once you're back on the Wi-Fi, you can upload everything into your portfolio area. Mahara is secure because everybody needs an account who shall be able to create content. Um, and encryption is um, turned on per default. And then organizations can, of course, um, add more security measures as needed. Mahara is also accessible. Um, currently, we are following the WCAG 2.0 standards and are having an investigation into the 2.1 standards and looking into what we want or need to change in Mahara in order to support those updated standards. Mahara can also be integrated um, with a whole bunch of different systems via web services or APIs. And typical ones are, of course, learning management systems like Moodle, Totara, Canvas, and um, others that um, allow for the connection and then in particular for single sign-on between the LMS and Mahara and also the assignment submission making it easy to store grades directly in the learning management system. And Mahara is customizable, um, not just in the theme, though that is the aspect that lots of people um, customize the most, but you can also install plugins or create, make changes because Mahara is open source. Um, there's no license fee involved and you can make any sort of changes that you like. Um, you can also contribute changes or new features back to the community and that is how the software grows and how it um, also makes it possible for lots of people to work quite uh, in quite diverse ways with Mahara. And Mahara portfolios are portable. Um, so we do offer um, two different um, export formats per default, um, we also have which are HTML and Leap2A. The Leap2A export allows port portfolios to be imported back into another Mahara instance. Um, and we also have an experimental PDF export, which does not just kind of print the pages, but also brings along all the underlying artifacts, so any of the files that had been uploaded into the portfolio. So lots of advantages and possibilities of working with Mahara. 
Now, if you are at the beginning of your exploration into portfolios, or you're interested in a particular aspect that you haven't quite looked into yet, um, here are four recommendations and suggestions for readings. Um, they are all um, freely available. Um, the first two for download and the other two can be looked at online. And they give you lots and lots of background information as well as references into anything ePortfolio related. And they have been created by the wider portfolio community. So they are not Mahara specific, but um, portfolios in general. And some do include examples of Mahara um, as case studies in order to show also what can be done there. And now um, we have two releases per year for Mahara and we have just had Mahara, the release of Mahara 20.10 um, two weeks ago. And so if you are already using Mahara and are interested in learning about the new features, please feel free to register for the last two remaining webinars um, that are going to be tonight, New Zealand time and tomorrow morning, New Zealand time. Um, and learn about what's new, what can come to your campus um, in the future. And if you have any questions, um, please do feel free to contact me via email or um, also give me a phone call. I'd be happy to talk more about Mahara with you.